Hi guys and welcome, Dembon here with the second episode of Fun Farms, the series where I'm taking one mob at a time and showing unique farms based around some interesting game mechanics. They might not be always super efficient or extra fast, but what they should do is make you think, wow, that's interesting, that's cool. Speaking of efficiency, I promise not to focus too much on it, but it turns out that we'll be having a closer look into this aspect of witch farms. The truth is, if you dive down into a specific game mechanic to investigate a specific mob or item, efficiency typically comes with it. Today, we'll be evaluating a bunch of witch farm designs. Why a bunch of them? Because I couldn't decide on the approach, so instead I thought it would be a great idea to put all of them to the test. All of the designs use survival-friendly techniques, however for the precise evaluation we will use the help of command blocks. So we are here in my world, in the middle of the swamp, in a perfect location to build a witch farm. The witch hut is located exactly in the middle of a large flat swamp, surrounded for the most part with oceans, without any major landmass less than 150 blocks away. So even if this is an amplified terrain, it wouldn't be very hard to clean it all up in a survival scenario. I did all the cleaning in my survival world, but to be 100% sure that there are no spawning spaces within 128 blocks around the witch hut, with some to spare, for the purpose of the test, I fill up in creative all the air spaces below the water with sea lanterns. This allowed me to make sure that the witch hut is the only space for the mobs to spawn. The three spawning platforms are encased with light blocking ceiling and floor. The use of ceiling was obvious to me, but I didn't know that the daylight can creep on shallow waters underneath the overhangs. So I built the same size floor as well to block this source of light. Underneath the farm, I voted all the blocks up to Y33, placed a floor of hoppers on it with an extra layer of half slab to prevent slimes from spawning. Yes, it's a slime chunk. A floor at Y34.5 makes all the witches die from fall damage. The system contains of three measurable AFK locations, first at the center of the drop shoot at Y34.5, making mobs unable to despawn once these are falling. Second AFK location is at Y95.5, which makes witches unable to despawn on the spawning platforms of the witch hut, but they can theoretically randomly despawn falling down the chute, although the probability of this event is very slim. The third location is at Y160.5, which allows mobs to drop without the risk of immediate despawning, which requires the least work on the lighting up the caves in the real survivor scenario. So let us now get a closer look at the contestants. Contestant number one is a traditional full shifting floor design based on mobs glitching through moving blocks of the floor. This is the only design that is not intended to work in Minecraft 1.9, but I included it here to use as a baseline to compare performance of the other designs. Why this design provides the most optimal solution? Simply because all the spawning spaces are available all the times for spawning, mobs are removed almost instantaneously from the spawning area and killed as fast as they can be killed with a fall damage. This provides perfect condition for next mobs to spawn with no limitation on the spawning area. The shifting floor is operated using the mechanism that I have borrowed from Snowcrash's Wither Skeleton Farm, which I also use in my 1.9 compatible Wither Skeleton Farm design. It uses trip wires connected to pistons with redstone blocks that when triggered enable the simple hopper clock, which we use to shift the floor. One side of the floor operates on one tick delay, the other side on three ticks delay, providing essential four game ticks or two redstone ticks delay between opposing pistons allowing them to move the floor back and forth in each cycle. Again, this will not work in 1.9, but will provide us with an upper boundary of the performance of the other farms. Contestant number 2 is a design where every other block in the spawning floor has been replaced with an open fence gate. This reduces the number of spawning spaces, but still allows to have all the benefits of the full shifting floor design. You might be thinking, but this is gonna reduce the efficiency by half. Not necessarily, the old 7x9 size of a witch hut allows to use less fence gates comparing to full spawning blocks than with an even spawning area, with the spawning spaces reduced to 56%, not 50% comparing to the full floor. Also with the full floor it was still possible that the mob would stand in between blocks and get stuck on them and not glitch through for a while, while here we have proper blocks with no collision mask which makes mobs drop every time. Also, the pack spawning algorithm would mitigate some of the spawning area issues by actively searching for locations to spawn witches after the first one is found. 
The third contestant is a water flash design proposed by Exuma, which uses water streams to push mobs from the platforms. The link to the video with the design is in the description. This design uses most of the spawning spaces of the original witch hut, but skips one row because of the limitations how far water can flow from behind the piston that holds it. The other drawback is the fact that water uses considerably longer time to wipe the witches off the platform and keep the platforms flooded, which prevents other mobs from spawning on these places. This fact has a definite impact on the performance of the farm, which we will measure in our evaluation. The fourth contestant is an improved design of the previous water flash based farm that adds the remaining 27 spawning spaces to the equation by mirroring the mechanisms that release the water on the other side and attaching it to pistons that control the extra floor element. So when the tripwire is triggered, it releases the water on one side and removes the floor on the other side, leaving a one wide gap for mobs to fall through. It looked to me like a giant mouth that opens to bite you, so I called the design the jaws. The extra spawning spaces not only should not have negative impact on the water that spills on the platform, but also removes mobs that spawn there immediately like in the shifting floor design, which potentially improves the efficiency per spawning space comparing with the initial water flash design. The only problem is that mobs from upper platforms have to briefly stop on each floor before they can fall further, which adds a slight hiccup to their fall. For the fifth contestant, I decided to use a different mechanics than water to push mobs out of the platforms. Water works and is easy to deal with, but the amount of spillage it generates seems to have a great impact on the performance. This time we'll be using slime bug pushers. They didn't work for a while as they stopped working with an update where entities finally stopped glitching into the blocks. However, this wasn't an intended behavior and I am pleased to confirm that in the recent snapshot this has been fixed and the mob swiper started working again. I like this design of the swipers a lot as it doesn't require an extra circuitry to turn them around when they get to the end of the belts. They just turn by themselves when they reach the end of the signal line. I've seen this design in a video by Alonofer in their Wither Skeleton farm, which I will link in down in the description. The swipers are built by simply putting two sticky pistons facing into a slime block which holds the swiping bar, connected directly to the control signal on the side. And the control circuit is also very simple, yet not trivial. To move the swiping bars back and forth, we need a cycle of 5 ticks of pulse pattern on, off, on, on, off. The odd period of 5 ticks doesn't allow the use of traditional comparator clocks, which give even length cycles, so instead we have here a 5 tick long repeater loop, which we can feed with 1 tick pulse by this lever. We can then grab this pulse and delay and extend to 2 ticks by this repeater here, we grab both of those pulses through the slab step, which acts like a diode, not allowing the signal to feed back into the pulse clock. This creates this on-off, on-on-off pattern signal on the blocks that power the swipers, which we then move up and down to the other floors. Clicking this lever into the off position breaks the pulse clock, stopping the farm. The position of the swipers is not relevant. However, they have to be on the upper portion of the top floor because one block above the top floor starts the area outside the witch farm where other mobs, including spiders, can spawn. And they will spawn on the swiper slime blocks if the swiper is on the lower position. As you can see, the entire structure has to be changed to slime block approved non-movable blocks, so I used obsidian for spawning spaces and wiring and melons for the shell and looks. It seems that this design uses all the spawning spaces, but the area immediately below the current position of a swiper is excluded from spawning, as it's occupied by a swiper block. This essentially reduces the spawning area by 7 blocks at each floor. On the other hand, there is no spilled water and other witches can still spawn on the other spaces while some of them are being pushed out of the platforms. The drawback is the client-side lag that the swipers cause, however I didn't notice any significant impact on the server side which deals with blocks being placed and destroyed in a much simpler way. Now let's switch to the evaluation setup, which is the same for all of those farms. I positioned it on top of the roof of the farms. Let me show the process I went through designing it. In the first version, we have a simple detection of a player holding a torch. This allows wirelessly turn on the farm when the player assumes the position. This raises difficulty from peaceful to hard resets the clocks and starts the chain of 12 despawn timers, 
each contributing exactly 5 minutes to the delay. After 1 hour and a few seconds, the last pressure plate is triggered, which stops the farm by setting difficulty to peaceful and displays the elapsed time to the operator for verification. The operator can now drop down to the collection area where drops are collected to place them in the proper chest for counting. This would be a good solution for a one-time run of the system to get the rough idea how it works. And I did it once for all the farm designs I described here and for all the AFK positions. What I found though is that there was a significant variability in the obtained results even for the same design and the same AFK position, indicating that more statistically meaningful trials needed to be performed to determine the significance of the estimated farm yield results. This meant I needed to repeat the experiment several times for each design and each AFK location. This led me to the final evaluation setup using scoreboard statistics. This is the first time for me to work with them, so if there's a better way of doing it, please let me know in the comments. I use the following commands. The first one creates a variable that will store our mob drop count. The next one increases this counter by one. The third one displays the current statistics to the player using tell row command. And the last one destroys and resets the count information. I was also experimenting with the signed books as they promised to allow to play statistics in them but it seems that they are being evaluated when the player opens the book for the first time and not when the book is placed in one's inventory. So they would all display the current value of the counter, not the one that we were interested when the book was placed in our inventory. The good thing about tail row commands is the fact that after a few hours of AFKing, we see the results right away. But on the other hand, if the game crashes on us in between, the only place to retrieve the lost results is server logs, which not everybody has access to. So after play is detected holding a torch, the system starts, the count is created, difficulty is raised to hard, time is reset, common block output is disabled, otherwise we will see all the messages for each drop in chat, and one hour delay timer is triggered. After one hour, common block output is enabled to tell the operator about the time this round took, disables the command block output again, and tells in chat the current score. After that, the counter is reset and the system is triggered again to start next round automatically. So after a couple of hours of AFK, operator can inspect the chat and write down the results of each round. This allows for a reliable and simple way of measuring the drop count of the farm. The collection area also changes, where the drops are being dropped into the lava, but before that happens, it triggers the counter bump, using one of the commands I just presented. As you can see, if I drop here something, the counter goes up by one, if I drop some more items, all of them are being correctly registered by the dropper clock. In total, I ran each system for 10 hours at each AFK position, which all ended up in 2 weeks of AFKing, and I placed all the cumulative results in these graphs. Graphs? They're boring. Maybe, but they can tell a lot and answer many questions. I'll be brief on this, I promise. The bars indicate the average yield from each farm at each AFK location. The range of the green square at the top of each bar indicates the error of the main estimation. In short, the actual score of the farm should be somewhere within this rectangle. The red bracket indicates the standard deviation of the results of the farm, indicating how each individual count after one hour of AFK can differ from other rounds, which is surprisingly significant and rather large for all of the designs, indicating how spawning algorithm can vary from tick to tick. Another conclusion you can draw from it is the fact that AFKing at Y160 is as good as being at any other point around the farm, which means that we are not sacrificing efficiency being at Y160 as a trade-off for lighting less caves beneath. It seems that simply Y160 is in general as good as any other AFK position around the farm. Let us now look at the final conclusions of the performance of each farm. The full shifting floor, which would not be with us in 1.9, has 189 effective spawning spaces, produces 7100 drops per hour with the efficiency of 37.5 drops per spawning space per hour. Contestant number 2, shifting floor with a simple fix using open fence gates with only 107 spawning spaces, achieved 4600 drops per hour, which is 35% less comparing to the full 1.8 compatible floor. An efficiency of 43 drops per spawning space, which is 14% more comparing to the benchmark. Many thanks to the pack spawning. It still remains a viable option for those who already built their farms in 1.8,
and want a quick fix to have their farms up and running in 1.9. Contestant number 3, the simple water flush design with 162 effective spawning spaces scored 4900 drops per hour, which is 31% less comparing to the full 1.8 compatible floor, an efficiency of only 30 drops per spawning space, which is 20% less comparing to the benchmark. It is a good design for those that want to spend minimum resources to build a simple farm and still get a good yield of their farm. Contestant number 4, the Jaws, with 189 effective spawning spaces, same as the baseline, scored 5400 drops per hour, which is 24% less comparing to the full 1.8 compatible floor, an efficiency of 29 drops per spawning space, which is 24% less comparing to the benchmark. With similar efficiency ratings comparing to the simple water flash design and utilizing all the available spawning spaces, it is a better overall choice for a relatively lag-free farm when the resources to build it are not so much of an issue. Contestant number 5, the Swiper, with 168 effective spawning spaces, scored 6300 drops per hour, which is only 11% less compared to the full 1.8 compatible shifting floor, an efficiency of 37.5 drops per spawning space, which is exactly the same as the benchmark. With best result among all the evaluated 1.9 compatible designs and same efficiency per spawning space as the 1.8 benchmark, it seems like the winner, however, one has to take into account that it is the laggiest of all of the designs, which might put some strain on the server and the client while in use. So all our candidates for the best witch farm for 1.9 performed decently, and since all of them had their unique advantages, I guess now you have to decide on your own, which one would you choose? If neither of them tickle your fancy and you are thinking about something completely different, Feel free to use the evaluation setup which I linked in the description to evaluate your own design. If you did decide to do so, please let me know what design you came up with and what score did you get. Cheers! That's all what I have prepared for today. Thank you guys for watching. If you liked it, please subscribe, leave a like, cheers, and leave a comment down in the comment area and share with others. See you in the next one. Bye bye!